We are in the year of promise. That's the declaration over 2020, and it's no longer just the prophetic declaration, but because the calendar has changed, we are actually now living in the year of promise. And promise, 2020, uh, means so many different things to so many different people, and we prayerfully have allowed God to write on the tablets of our hearts his intentions and his desire and his design for this season. But there may be some of us for whom Promise 2020 is still just the tagline or the hashtag on our messages and social media this year. And what I mean by that is, how many of you have been to the beach? Yeah, right? The beach, the pool. You see people out there immersed in swimming. Um, you see them surfing and they're on all this type of equipment, they're getting wet, they dive in, and it, is, it looks like real fun, right? And so we can stand on the shore and we can see them enjoying themselves and we can see them going through the motions of swimming and doing the breaststroke and we're excited and you know, those are people just like we're people and so we affirm and we nod our heads that yes, swimming is fun, but if you're like me, I got this hair that's not real beach friendly. <laughs> And sometimes I feel a little self-conscious come swimsuit season. So while I affirm that swimming looks fun, while I affirm that people can have fun doing it, while I affirm that they can actually engage in all of the water fun activities, then I never get wet. And for so many of us, that's a picture of our experience spiritually. We hear the tagline. We might even post it on our social media. And we nod our heads, yeah, God promised 2020. Clap when it comes on. We might get a little loud and get a little loose, but at the end of the day, we're more anchored in something else, some one else, some other agenda, some other affection, some other attachment, so we never dive in, take the risk, and get wet. What I will say to you today, TPC, is that God never intended for us to be like Moses on the edge of the promised land, surveying and affirming that this is everything God said it was, and it has everything God promised it would be, but we never take the steps to enter in. God is calling out the Joshua's and the Caleb's and those who will go in and enter in and lay out and stretch out and reach out and not just give him my head, not mental assent, but fully engage. And what our message is titled today, wholehearted devotion. So what, what does that look like? This is message two in the series from scarcity to generosity. And a lot of times when you think about generosity, and I've even had to check myself, it's not from scarcity to abundance. Get all you can, can all you get, right? It's scarcity to generosity because we're not called to be pools or dams. We're called to be reservoirs that pour out fountains of living water. We are attached to the, the source so we can be a resource in the earth. So God is moving us from scarcity, not to abundance, but to generosity. And too often we think about that path like the yellow brick road. It's going to be full of all kinds of stuff. There's my promotion. There's my fixed marriage. There's my, my healing. And there's my happy kid. And there's my prodigal coming home. And yes and amen, God may choose to accomplish all of that as he moves us out of scarcity and into generosity but more often than looking like a road littered with stuff it looks like a path littered with altars wow. altars are places where we surrender and when we move from scarcity to generosity what we find is it's not about more stuff it's about more surrender. This morning, if you're soaping along with us, 
we got to read several relevant encounters that pertain directly to today's message, look at God. But what we left with this morning was, how do you love God? You don't love him with your leftovers. And you don't love him on the same level as you love your Jaguar, you love your Michael Kors bag, you love that man, that woman, that boy, that girl. But God says, I want you to love me with everything. I want you to love me with all, and all includes everything. There is nothing excluded from all. So God says, love me with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your strength, all of your soul, all of your ambition, all of your appetite, all of your desire, all of everything that you is, bad English, I want you to love God with that. Amen? Amen. So today's message, from scarcity to generosity, wholehearted devotion. So let's pick this up in Philippians 3. And of course, I'm reading from the Passion Translation. So I pray that that is what is before you on the screen. Um, Philippians, of course, is authored by Paul. And if you spend any time in Sunday school or VBS, you're very familiar with Paul's writings because much of the New Testament is the basis of our memory verses, right? So Philippians 3.12 from the Passion Translation reads, I admit that I haven't yet acquired the absolute fullness that I'm pursuing, but I run with passion into his abundance so that I may reach the purpose that Jesus Christ has called me to fulfill and wants me to discover. I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. However, I do have one compelling focus. I forget all of the past as I fasten my heart to the future instead. I run straight for the divine invitation of reaching the heavenly goal and gaining the victory prize through the anointing of Jesus. Amen. 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 So I, um, I'm a granddaughter of a Baptist preacher. And every now and then that Baptist preacher seeps out. <laughs> But one of the things I can recall hearing as the granddaughter of a Baptist preacher is that salvation is absolutely free, but it will cost you everything. Yeah. And I remember like, well, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> free generally means there's no cost. And to say it's free, but it's not only going to cost, it's going to cost me everything, sounds like an oxymoron but walk with him a little while. Encounter him in dry places and in dark spaces and in disappointed places. And that's where we find the cost of salvation. Because when I'm journeying through the valley of the shadow of death and the only thing present is a rod and a staff, it costs me something to continue to affirm that I serve the God of the resurrection. Yeah. It costs me something to continue to affirm that he is my provider, that he is my shepherd, that he is my defender, that I am an overcomer, that I am more than a conqueror, and that who he is and what he said about me is enough for me. We saw the cost of salvation this week in our soap devotional. We encountered the rich young ruler. And he comes to Jesus. And he says, I'm seeking eternal life. So tell me, what do I have to do? Notice the emphasis. What must I do to be saved? And we don't see it written but I imagine in his back pocket he had his resume. So Jesus begins to engage him. He says, well, honor your mother and your father. Do these commandments. He lists, I don't know, five or six, and he doesn't do them in order. And so in his back pocket, he's checking off his resume. I did that, I did that. I, I'm feeling pretty good about this salvation thing. <laughs> I should be good to go. But then Jesus points his finger in his chest. He touches his heart's affection. 
the thing that he's relying on. And he says to him, one more thing. One more thing. Go sell everything you have and come follow me. That young man, I bet his jaw dropped, his shoulders slumped, his head went down, and it says he walked away sad. He had not given anything, but he knew all of a sudden what he desired, he could not obtain without taking leave of what he valued more. God is after us today. And he's been on this hunt for this body of people. I dare say it didn't just begin today. I know so many of us came into TPC at different points in our faith walk, in different points in our relationships, at different points in our journey with Jesus, in our journey with community. And God is still on a hunt. I want you to identify what you value more and let it go. I want you to identify what you love more and let it go. We began this year in the book of Jonah and we heard Hebrew over everything, right? And for some of us that was, well, maybe it's not Hebrew, but it's something over everything. And it might not be something I say out loud, but when Jesus goes to touch that thing, do my shoulders slump? Does my head hang low? And do I walk away disappointed? Or am I still like Abraham, everywhere I go, erecting an altar? Because in that place, I gave God my yes. Amen. So now let's take a look in the uh, book of Ruth. We're going to look at Ruth, and we'll start in chapter 1. And it's after Judges, for you Old Testament rookies. <laughs> Praise God. We are in the book of Ruth. We're in chapter 1, and I'm going to pick it up in verse 6. It says, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore, she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with uh, me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back my daughters, go. For I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and Ruth clung to her. And she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. So when you talk about wholehearted devotion, this right here is an awesome picture of what it looks like to be wholeheartedly devoted. Just to give you a little background, it's the book of Ruth. It begins and it opens with Naomi. And Naomi is the patriarch, I'm sorry, matriarch, right, of this 
flourishing family. Naomi is married to a man of stature, status, and she has these strong sons. And in this time in scripture, sons were an indication of lineage and wealth and inheritance because that's how things traveled. And so there's a famine in Bethlehem. It's not looking real good at home. So they say, well, let's go to Moab. And they get to Moab. And because these sons are strong and virile young men, of course they find wives in Moab. And so one son marries Orpah and the other son marries Ruth. But hard times befall Naomi in Moab. In, the, in Moab, first Naomi's husband dies. So now Naomi is a widow, but listen, I still got these two boys and they're married to these young women. It's going to be all right. But then, but not one, but both sons die. So Naomi, who left the land of Judah prosperous and blessed and fruitful and vibrant is now headed back home because Moab has real hard times. But she says to those young women, her daughters involved, she says to them, listen, you have gone above and beyond. You stayed with me, you loved me, you cared for me, but I'm gonna go home. And the custom or the tradition in that day would be if there was another brother living, that those two widowed sister-in-laws could, could marry another brother, again, so we could preserve the lineage and inheritance. But Naomi says to them not once but twice, listen, I have no more sons. And even if I got married tonight, you gonna wait around 20 years? Nah, y'all go home. Go to your mother-in-law's. I pray y'all get remarried and that you find fruitfulness and happiness. So Orpah, bless her heart, says, all right, I'm gonna head out. <laughs> I, I did what I was supposed to do. I gave her my reasonable service. But Ruth has a different heart. Ruth has a different type of dedication, a different type of commitment. It's a different type of devotion. And Ruth's devotion to Naomi is such that she says, no, <laughs> where you go, I'll go. Where you die, I'll die. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And heaven help me if anything but my death prevents me from fulfilling this vow. Naomi said, I won't argue with you anymore. But what I want you to hear in this is it wasn't just Ruth's devotion to Naomi. Ultimately, it turned out to be Ruth's devotion to God and to God's purpose for her life because Ruth had to live chapter one. We just get to read about it. We get to read chapters one through four. We know how the story ends. We know that there is a Boaz and there is an inheritance and there is a place in the lineage and genealogy of the Messiah himself. We get to read about it. Ruth had to live it. Ruth had to live it. She doesn't know that Boaz is waiting for her in chapter 4. She's in chapter 1, verse 18. It's still some living, some revelation, some encounter, some surrender to come. But see, the beauty of all of this is that Ruth didn't know, but God does. Ruth didn't know, but God does. What does God know about you? And what does God know about me? That he is instructing to prepare us now because he knows where we're going and he knows who we're becoming and he knows what's required and he knows what lineage and what legacy we're supposed to leave behind. And so he's trying to put pieces in place right now and line us up and position us. But none of this gets to happen absent Ruth's total surrender. There is a total devotion that goes on. This language is strong, y'all. It's not, well, I'll go with you and I'll check it out. And if the area is, is good for us, and if it seems convenient to me and conducive to me, I'll stay with you a little while longer. This is that ride or die language we talked about in this place. This is that unless death himself comes to the door, I'm with you. That's what wholehearted devotion looks like. And that, that, that is our first truth. Wholehearted devotion requires that we adjust our plans and our priorities so that we can pursue the thing we value more. 
It's an adjustment in our plans. It's an adjustment in what I was going to do and where I was going to go and how I was going to live and what I had planned for. We have to adjust that in order to pursue who and what we value more. And I'm going to tell you guys, I'm going to do, I will say by the power of the Holy Ghost, what God has been saying to me all week, check yourself. This is a heart check message. Because so many of us are easily swayed by comfort. And we are very finicky about our convenience. We are people who do not like our cheese moved. Because you're going to upset something. I was working on something. But I want you to know we serve a God who calls himself a shepherd gently leading. But we also serve the God who will go into a temple and turn over some tables. And I don't know about you, but I've been in some places with him like, Jesus, what are you doing? <laughs> I was good here. <laughs> I liked it here. I was comfortable here. But God is not so much concerned with our comfort as he is with our conformity into the image of Jesus Christ. And so he does things that to us seem inconvenient. And there are things that we are in this moment calling an interruption. But God is saying it's not an interruption. This is a divine intervention. He's still after some things. This morning, he is putting his finger in the middle of our chest. I want to identify what you value more. And when you find it, I want you to give it to me. Amen. Let's go a little bit further. A little bit further. Let's take a look back in the book of Philippians. Take a look in the book of Philippians. We're going to go back to chapter 3, but we're going to start. We'll pick up in... Uh, Verse 5, instead of where we were before, we're going to go Philippians 3. We're going to do verse 5. And I'm reading from the Passion Translation. And this is Paul. He's giving, giving us his resume, but let's see where it ends. So Paul says, I was born a tree, true Hebrew of the heritage of Israel as the son of a Jewish man from the tribe of Benjamin. I was circumcised eight days after my birth, and I was raised in the strict tradition of Orthodox Judaism, living a separated and devout life as a Pharisee. And concerning the righteousness of the Torah, no one surpassed me. I was without a peer. Furthermore, as a fiery defender of the truth, I persecuted the Messianic believers with religious zeal. Paul is telling you, listen, I was a bad man. I was a bad man. Yet, of all of the accomplishments that I once took credit for, I've now forsaken them and I regard it all as nothing compared to the delight of experiencing Jesus Christ my Lord. To truly know him meant letting go of everything from my past and throwing all of my boasting on the garbage heap. It's like a pile of manure to me now so that I may be enriched in the reality of knowing Jesus Christ and embrace him as Lord in all of his greatness. I had to let go of one in order to fully embrace the other. There is no standing in the middle, murky shade of gray thing, right? It's all here or all here. And Paul is telling you and he's telling me, I had to let all of that go so I could fully embrace all of him. My passion is to be consumed with him and not clinging to my own righteousness based in keeping the written law. My righteousness will be his based on the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, the very righteousness that comes from God. And I continually long to know the wonders of Jesus more fully and to experience the overflowing power of his resurrection working in me. I will be one with him in his sufferings and I will be one with him in his death. Only then will I be able to experience complete oneness with him in the resurrection from the realm of death. I admit that I haven't yet acquired the absolute fullness that I'm pursuing, but I run with passion into his abundance so that I may reach the purpose that Jesus Christ has called me to fulfill and wants me to discover. So the second truth that we uh, want to set before you is that every advancement, spiritual or natural, requires a new level of sacrifice. 
you probably already know this if you, you know, you, get, you seek promotion in your career field, you seek to advance um, in your physical health. There are some things that you sacrifice or you put down in order to get to that place, to, to that thing, to that desired goal. It's the same thing spiritually. Every advancement, spiritually or naturally, will require a, and I'll say this, a new level of sacrifice. Because what you did to move up from one rank to another may not advance you to the rank that's beyond that, right? There's a new level of sacrifice involved in every advancement. So I'll tell you, um, in January 2019, I went back to school to pursue my master's degree. And it's been a journey, still working on it, in process. I graduated with my undergraduate in 1999. So from December 99 to December 2018, I was not in a class. I dropped in periodically, but wasn't real serious about pursuing anything. In the fall of 2006, God spoke to me and told me I was supposed to go back to school in the fall of 2006. Wow. Yeah, right? <laughs> God said that. And you know what I offered God at the time was, you know, I'm, I'm raising these kids, and I was, traveling the world with this man, and, and I was, amen. And, and so there were a couple other things that were going on. I had already invested some money pursuing a different degree, and those credits might still be good, Jesus. Like, you know, and it wasn't like, you know, well, this was a general type requirement. Like, I'm going to have to start from scratch. <laughs> I'm going to have to go back to zero, Jesus. And so it, it's not necessarily convenient. Money, money's a little funny, you know, like, you know, we still got these babies, right? We're working some things out. God knew all of that. But God had spoken. So fast forward, we're in 2015 now. Now I'll tell you, I didn't start till January 2019. We hit the end of 2015. And I'm in a different space in life. I'm a semi-empty nester. We got one kid out the door. The other kid has a driver's license and a debit card. So I'm feeling pretty good about my responsibilities there. I'm in a decent place in my career where I'm not hustling. I go to work and I leave work at work, come home. That man is retired. So now we got a little bit more free time and we're in a comfortable space. Serving in ministry, I'm active, but you know, God is good. Yes and amen. All is well, but it's still, you're supposed to be in school. Now at this point, I can't use the children can't use the man, honestly couldn't even really use the financial, uh, you know, excuse. Then it wasn't a matter of these things were going on. Then it was a real, a matter of my heart. I like my free time. I've been raising these kids, traveling, working. I've been doing this for like 20 years, Jesus. I, I don't have to rush home to get anybody to practice. I don't have to be, you know, Rachel Ray in the kitchen every night after working. People can fend for themselves. They can make their own meals. I get to come home and just be me, just do me. I was really excited about that. But God, God knows who we are. God knows where we are. God knows who we are to become and God knows where we are going and his instructions may not seem convenient to you. They may not be comfortable to you, but trust me, they are for your good because we all know what it is to suffer under poor leadership. When people get places and they are not prepared. I don't wanna go into the doctor's office and have him say, hmm, let me look that up. <laughs> I need to know that when I come to you, you're ready with the resolution that I stand in need of. And God knows who he's sending to me and who he's sending to you. And trust that his instructions are part of your equipping. And very rarely are we really equipped and are we really getting good instruction when we're in comfortable places. Some of the best lessons we will ever get from heaven are in those tight places. 
in those rough spaces, in those not sure if I'm going to make it spaces, right? It's something about God's voice that gets real loud and clear when it's a life or death situation. We get in a place where we're willing, like when you get lost on the highway, you'll turn down your radio as if that has anything to do with it, right? <laughs> but I'm turning down, the, I'm telling everybody to be quiet because I just got to figure this out. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know how to, but that's when God is speaking loud and clear. So if there are some, some part of your journey that's going to take you through a valley, don't be scared. If it's going to take you through a dry place and a dark place, may you always hear God say to you, trust me. Trust me. That's it. At the end of all of this, at the end of our wholehearted devotion, the real question is, do you trust him? Do you trust him? And what are we waiting for? What are you waiting for? What have you heard God say to you that you still, hmm, mm, examining and reasoning and resisting? He's still pointing his finger in the center of our chest and asking you and me, what do you value more? Paul, like many of us, was very much on his grind. On the grind is Ebonics for working very hard at the thing that he had studied and positioned and prepared himself for that he thought would bring him great success. Yeah. So he was grinding, staying up late and getting up early. And every hour of his day was about this grind that is building his resume and positioning him for what he thought he was going to be and what he thought he was going to do. But what he found out is all of my grind is nothing compared to the grace that Jesus Christ extends me. There is nothing in my grind that would get me to exceedingly abundantly above all that he could ask or think. Nothing in my grind could equip me or position me or prepare me for what eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. That's all a work of grace. So if I've got to choose one, and trust me, you do, Paul says all of this is rubbish. It means nothing to me. Set my credentials on fire because that's all they're worth. I want what grace is extending to me. Amen. 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 So um, wholehearted devotion requires that we readjust our plans. We readjust our priorities. Wholehearted devotion is going to require that each of us decide that every advancement, every advancement is going to require a new level of sacrifice. There's something new, something different, something distinct about what God requires that I offer to him at this level than what he required for me to offer before. And our yes, giving God our yes, our wholehearted devotion is not a one and done decision, right? One, I did it once and, and I'm good forever. No, <laughs> no. Because your yes in this season may look very different than what he requires of you in the next. What you said yes to as a young woman or a young man looks different than when you hit that middle age and become a what, what chronologically superior, right? My, my yes in this season is way different than what my yes looked like 20 years ago. Amen. But remember, from scarcity to generosity, it's a path littered with altars and places where we continue to surrender because God is not the great I was. God is the great I am. And God is always in the process of reshaping and recasting and reframing and renewing and reviving and resurrecting to make all things new. And so our yes to him, we've got to revise. <laughs> We've got to renew, and for some of us, we might have to resurrect. What do I mean by that? When you started on the bottom, it's real easy to say, Thy will be done, because I got nothing else. <laughs> Not my way, God, because my way stinks, <laughs> and my way has got me broke, busted, and disgusted, so anything you can offer me right now is going to look real good. <laughs> so we real deep, <laughs> and we real spiritual when we real broke. But sometimes we can get real blessed. Amen. And God has made things real beautiful. And he comes again 
again and says, I require something more of you. And we can get in our contentment and we can get in our convenience and we can get in our common sense but then we will miss the wonders of the uncommon God we serve and the uncommon love he pours out and the uncommon grace he dispenses and the uncommon glory that he longs to manifest. But all of this is contingent upon our wholehearted devotion. So let's look at Luke 138. We'll close here. And in Luke 138, this is recording uh, Gabriel's encounters. He stops by Zachariah's house and he says, listen, old man, you're going to be a daddy. And that old man's response was such that the angel had to shut his mouth for nine months. And then he goes to visit Mary. And in Luke 138 from the Passion Translation, it says, Mary responded saying, this is amazing. I will be a mother for the Lord as his servant I accept whatever he has for me. May everything you have told me come to pass. And the angel left her. I accept whatever he has for me. Sometimes that's a hard truth. Because I don't know all that God has for me. I, I, I am aware that he's not as concerned about my convenience as I am. I am aware that he does not mind making me uncomfortable. And so to give him a whatever he has for me, I accept. Got to clear my throat and swallow hard. But this third truth is really designed maybe not to help you with the how, but to help you with the why wholehearted devotion is not just possible, but necessary. God is not some old bearded man in the sky like Thanos, right? Y'all watch the Avengers trying to get the gloves, seeking power for power's sake. That's not our God. Our God does not treat us as pawns, but he sees us as partners in fulfilling his will in the earth. We are not pawns, but we are partners with him in fulfilling his plan in the earth. We see it all throughout scripture. God doesn't invite man because he can't do it by himself. God invites man because he won't do it by himself. He says things like it won't be the same without you. And so he waits. He comes to this young virgin girl engaged and planning a wedding looking at arrangements and the flowers and thinking about how she'll decorate their space. And he gives her this impossible plan, some type of immaculate conception. And at the end of the discussion, she says, whatever you want, whatever you desire, I accept whatever your will is for me. Mary had to partner with God's plan for her life the same way you and I have to partner with God's plans for us. He's not a bully. He's not a thief. He's not a robber. God doesn't want to use you. God wants to know you. And so we partner with him to produce his desire and his design for the earth. He invites us to take ownership with him. He says, I made you to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, not, not so you could just say, oh my, what a view, but so you could be active and engaged in all he's doing in the earth now. So he extends this holy invitation. And he invites us to step out of this beggarly place where we see ourselves as just being run over by the enemy abused by the adversary, beaten up and torn down by life circumstances. And into this place where he says, I know you, I love you, I know your faults. <laughs> I know where you failed. I know where you don't think you are good enough 
You don't believe you're worthy enough. You don't believe you're smart enough. But none of that matters to me. I invite you to partner with me. Live in me and let me live in you. Let us together become something amazing. Do something that eyes have not seen and ear has not heard. I don't know about you, but if you're paying attention, the world doesn't need more of us. It needs more of him. Amen. And the only way the world gets to see more of him is if you and I are willing to give it to them. To go in and come out. Go in and come out. I'm going to wrap with this, but God's invitation, my invitation from him to you is, are you ready to live in this place of wholehearted devotion? Amen. Amen.